Hi, advocates. This is Julianne Giddy Edwards, your grassroots advocacy manager. With me is Molly McDonald, policy consultant at Fight CRC. We're joining you from Winning Strategies Washington to conduct your webinar for the Hill Day Fly In. Now, if you've chosen to fly in just for the Hill Day, um, you are a call on Congress veteran, and, uh, and we know that you know exactly what to expect when it comes to member meetings and sort of all the goings on here in DC. But just to give you a little background on what has happened in the past year and what our legislative goals and our specific asks are this year, we are doing this webinar to just sort of fill you in on what you might have missed on the previous two days of programming and call on Congress. So we're just asking that you watch this video before you come in and we're just gonna jump right into it. Now, on the screen, you'll see our legislative goals overview. We're gonna scroll through that um, as we go along and just sort of discuss all of the goals that we have. And we'll pull out um, as we go along the specific asks that we're going to be focusing on this year. Um, a lot of them will be familiar to you if you're a veteran, but um, the numbers and the specifics um, may have changed a little bit. So, so be sure to pay close attention. So um, we'll start with removing barriers to colorectal cancer screening. Now, this is one, um, the correcting the loophole in the Medicare policy requiring Medicare beneficiaries to pay coinsurance if polyps are detected. That is one of our huge issues this year. That's one of our main asks. If you're a veteran, you'll know it's been an ask for a while. Um, and, and we just ask that you have patience. We are, uh, you know, it takes a very long time for a bill to become law. But, um, but there have been, um, there has been progress. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what that progress has been and sort of how we're approaching this, um, this issue. So Molly, we've been working throughout the year with, um, with American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network, um, and Caroline Powers uh, will be presenting at Call on Congress on this issue. Um, so where is the bill right now? Great question. So to your earlier point, we have made great progress, but to those of you who have come to Call on Congress before, this has been on your ask sheet. You've been asking for it for a long time. Um, so the Removing Barriers to Colorectal Screening Act this year is H.R. 1017 and S. 479 in the Senate. So um, we have made great progress and we have over 250 co-sponsors, which is incredible. Yeah, I, can't, <laughs> I can't say enough. That's, it's not a common thing. That's not something that, that most bills or even many bills get. So um, we definitely, everyone deserves a hearty pat on the back for, for that. And it's something that we should be really proud of. Um, so as, as you mentioned, we've been working closely with ACS CAN on this as well um, and exploring multiple different options. So there's the legislative route, which would be moving the bill through the House and Senate and getting it signed by the president, um, which we continue to push on. But there's also um, a regulatory or administrative approach. So um, we are working with ACS CAN and they have hired um, some very smart lawyers to um, basically develop a brief arguing, arguing for why the administration has the power to make this change on their own without Congress acting. And so that would go through the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, correct? Correct. So this would be the CMS administrator with a stroke of her pen making that change and we could finally put um, this bill to bed. So we're, we're looking forward to to the work on that and um, you know, continuing to push sort of both of those strategies. So for now, the legislative ask is the one that our advocates are going to be making. Um, that bill, even though it has a lot of co-sponsors, as I understand it, is stuck in the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, can you explain why it's stuck? Yeah, so the bill has been referred to Ways and Means and Energy and Commerce, sort of the two committees that have the greatest jurisdiction over healthcare. Um, and the reason why it's largely been stuck is because the bill has a cost associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, through over the course of the past year, um, working again with ACS CAN, we've had meetings with um, staff for those committees and they understand the problem. They agree with us that this is silly, that it needs to be changed. Um, but in today's climate of 
any bill that has a cost associated with it is a challenge. So at the, at the moment, that's sort of our biggest hurdle in, in overcoming is, is figuring out ultimately how much will it cost? Um, can we account for the savings down the road that right. would approve if you, you know, are catching colorectal cancer early? Um, and that can be a difficult conversation with sort of the government budget office that, that ultimately makes that call. Um, but we're continuing those conversations and continuing to educate about what the impact of this bill really would be. So for our advocates um, to, you know, to go into the office and say, look, we know this costs money, but um, would you encourage them to sort of make that argument on, on the other side of, yes, it costs money, but as a colorectal cancer patient, I can, I can, or a caregiver, I can tell you that late stage colorectal cancer costs a lot more. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important to talk about the cost of care and of treatment. Um, and that includes, you know, doctor's visits, your medication, but also, you know, if you have to stop working or, you know, any sort of lost wages that um, result from, from your treatment or your diagnosis. So I think really drawing that um, distinction of, you know, the couple hundred dollars it may be for a colonoscopy versus the probably tens of thousands, if not more, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, yeah. it would be for, um, to treat someone for a late stage cancer. Great, so, so that's really, um, you know, that's one of our big asks. So if you have any questions about that, I, um, I, my email will be in, in this, um, uh, attached to this video. So, you know, or you can call me and we can discuss sort of strategies that you might want to take um, going into those meetings and making this ask. But for now, we'll move on. Um, so next on our list, we see the Protect 100% uh, insurance coverage for CRC screening and any Affordable Care Act replacement or reform. So there's been a lot of there's been a lot of dialogue around the ACA in the past year. Um, for our purposes, we really want to focus on coverage for screening and access to treatment. So we're going to talk a lot more about the ACA when we get down to the access uh, to treatment. Uh, in the protect the best interests of patients uh, section of our legislative goals, but just know that where you know it's not it's not the main ask this year, but we are just making sure that in any replacement or reform, we're going to try and see that that coverage. Yeah, and I think it's an important distinction here. So, the bill that we just talked about, the removing barriers to colorectal screening act, that's in the Medicare program. Right. So that is seniors, sixty five plus. It's public insurance. Um, the ACA is private insurance. So this is for basically everyone else right. um, with a few exceptions. So obviously, I'm sure everyone remembers, um, you know, earlier last year when there was a number of attempts to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Um, so during that time, we were very active in reaching out to members to, you know, educate them on the importance of coverage for screening right. um, and so it's sort of the second piece of, of that puzzle and it's something that we'll continue to monitor and work on but as of right now I think the sort of um, main threats to the ACA have passed mm -hmm. um, so we included in here because it continues to be important but um, we're not going to include it in our whole day. Right. Exactly. So um, moving on to appropriations. So this still falls under removing barriers to colorectal cancer screening, but it does kind of hinge on the whole appropriations um, idea. So March, it falls squarely in appropriation season, as it were. So, um, so this asks, appropriating 70 million for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, links into screening because the CDC funds these programs in all 50 states that are that contribute to to screening and raising you know the, the rate of screening across the nation so when we're asking for this particular funding increase what's the best way to ask for that yeah so i think kind of talking a little bit about the program is really important so the crccp is unique in the sense that, as you mentioned, it's a grant program that goes directly to the states and allows the states to sort of create a screening program around their unique population. 
focusing particularly on the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So this is getting at the people that have the lowest screening rates, who may be most hesitant to go in and get screened, um, but have really high risk factors. So it's really getting at sort of the biggest bang for our buck, the most medias, and the places that we can make the most impact. Um, and it's customizable, so it's not saying that each state has to do it the same way. It's allowing them the flexibility to kind of tailor and make the changes that they need to make the biggest gains in their states. And we've seen that from, from the programs in the state. They're, they're making good progress. And just so you know, um, in your training materials, which will get on site, we will have each state's screening rate. And if there have been any you know, serious successes under this program, then those will be highlighted for you as well. So you can bring that up in your, in your ask. Um, the overall ask for investment in colorectal cancer research is one of our um, priorities along with the, the screening bill this year. So as we move on to appropriations centered around research, this is something that we are gonna really ask you to hammer home in your meetings um, and connect your stories to. And just on that point, um, the, the screening bill, depending on your age of diagnosis and, and, and all sorts of factors, might not connect directly to your story, but when it comes to colon cancer research, colorectal cancer research, um, it's very easy for any patient or caregiver to connect to research because any treatment um, began as a clinical trial. Um, and any, obviously we're all hoping for advancement in treatments and, and hopefully a cure. So it, it's very easy to connect your story to this ask. Um, what's a little more difficult is really understanding the appropriations process and understanding exactly where these funding streams go. So let's talk first about the NIH apps. Um, we're asking for at least 38 billion. So, um, and including the six billion for NCI. So when we're talking about colorectal cancer research, what role does NIH's research play? And why is it so important that we see this floor increase of, of 38 billion? Yeah, I think it's really important because NIH does a lot of the sort of basic foundational research that is sort of underwrites all of the most incredible treatments and cures that we've seen over the past several decades. So, you know, right now we're seeing sort of um, growth and new um, breakthroughs in immunotherapy. All of that started at the NIH. Mm -hmm. um, and they're doing a lot of the basic research that a lot of pharmaceutical companies don't have the wherewithal or the want to invest in. Yeah. So they're kind of ramping up and laying that foundation. Um, and it takes a lot of time. So, you know, research on immunotherapy started decades ago. And, you know, we're just now in the past couple of years starting to see the real breakthroughs. So it's not only important that we, you know, increase funding for NIH, but that it's reliable and it's stable and it's continual um, because if researchers are going to continue to make advancements, they need that certainty that their job and their research is going to be there year after year. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, um, so that's the NIH ask. The other side of this is the DOD ask. So we have, <clears throat> pardon me, um, in the advocates group, we talked a lot about the DOD program, the, um, the peer-reviewed cancer research program. And it was one of Fight CRC's sort of crowning advocacy achievements of adding colorectal cancer to the list of the 11 cancers that are included under that program. So the DOD program is different than the NIH. Uh, you know, obviously it's, it's, it does a little bit more sort of um, outside the box, I would say, research. Yeah. yeah, I would call it sort of like high risk, high reward. Um, yeah. So they're doing research that, um, I don't want to say crazy, but it's a, a, you know, a little bit more out there because that's often where the biggest breakthroughs come from. So they have a little more flexibility to take the risks and do the research that um, could really, really make a big impact. 
Okay. And so when we're asking for 2000, fiscal year 2019 is what we're looking for in all of these. Um, we're looking at a $60 million ask mm -hmm. there. So, so that's increased from last year. Um, why is it so important that that funding increases as well? Yeah, I think it's you know the same reason that we're looking at for NIH. It's can, it's important to be able to continue to have that stability and to continue to make that progress. Additionally, um, more cancers are being added each year, so that sort of makes the pot for each individual cancer get a little smaller. So if we're continuing to increase that funding, it's ensuring that sort of no one's getting the short end of the stick. Yeah, okay. So, um, protecting the best interests of patients. So, we told you we were gonna come back to the ACA. This is sort of where we're gonna do it. Um, the impact of the ACA on access to treatment. Obviously, you know, for, for folks on Medicaid and Medicare, well, Medicare, um, the, it's not as, it, the ACA is not as impactful, but uh, for folks that are on the individual exchange, have employer-based insurance, or who are on Medicaid and Medicaid expansion states, like this is, this is pretty huge. Yeah. So again, this is not going to be our focus this year, but let's just go over sort of um, how it affects colorectal cancer patients. Obviously, pre-existing conditions, one of the most popular um, aspects of the ACA, um, you know, the elimination of the coverage caps, again, so expensive to treat, especially late stage colorectal cancer. Um, and let's talk a little bit about essential health benefits, um, because we, we have seen, um, again, this is not the focus of, of our asks, but we have seen a little bit of an erosion from the administration mm -hmm. on essential health benefits. Um, how would that affect colorectal cancer patients? Yeah, so as we talked about earlier, we've sort of largely, not really, gotten <laughs> over the hump of, We never know what's coming. Yeah, yeah, of sort of the congressional attack on the Affordable Care Act. Um, they have largely decided that what's done is done, mm -hmm. and they're moving on. Um, the administration has taken a different tact, so they are trying to do whatever is within their power and within their jurisdiction to um, to roll back some of these protections. So um, the essential health benefits are incredibly important because that's when that that's where that prevention piece comes in. Right. So ensuring that folks have access to screening mm -hmm. um, at no cost. Um, and so some of what the administration is trying to do is to create plans in the marketplace that are exempt from having to require the essential health benefits. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't cover screening, but it means that they will not be required to. Right. Um, and, you know, it's a cost to the insurer. So there's a, a great chance that that's something that they might let drop off. So again, it's something that we continue to monitor. We have commented on each of the administration's actions thus far and continue to work with our coalition partners, um, which has been really effective and impactful to mm -hmm. be able to stand arm in arm with dozens, if not hundreds of other um, cancer and other disease groups um, yeah. to say, this is not okay and these things are important. Yeah, absolutely. And the entire patient community is really sort of on guard mm -hmm. for, for all of these changes. Again, as an advocate going into these meetings that, you know, that'll be a sort of an ancillary focus, but, um, but the two big asks, again, are the screening bill and investment in colorectal cancer research. Mm -hmm. So, we hope this has been informative. Um, and again, if you have any questions about, about the asks, about strategy, uh, really anything sort of gearing up to call on Congress, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, my email will be linked to this video. Um, and thank you so much for participating. We look forward to seeing you in DC. Thanks, see you in March.